Imagine a water balloon. It's plump, filled to the brim, and if you press it, it indents before bouncing back. That's a bit like edema, a medical condition we're diving into today. Picture this. Your body's tissues acting like a sponge, soaking up excess fluid and swelling in response. This is edema in a nutshell, the collection of fluid in interstitial spaces or serous cavities that has become clinically evident. When this happens all over, we call it generalized edema or anascara. Earlier, generalized edema was known as dropsy. But why does this happen? A few culprits come to mind. For instance, increased capillary permeability due to damage in case of acute inflammation can cause edema. Or perhaps it's increased capillary pressure at play, a hallmark sign of congestive cardiac failure. So in essence, edema is your body's own water balloon. But why does it happen? Let's find out. Edema might seem unique, but it has some siblings in the medical world. Let's meet them. When you think about edema, remember it's not a lone ranger. There are other conditions that are surprisingly similar yet uniquely different. Let's start with hypoproteinemia. This is a condition where there's a decrease in the osmotic pressure of blood due to a deficiency of proteins, particularly albumin. This can lead to fluid accumulation in interstitial spaces, causing edema. Hypoproteinemia is often linked to nutritional deficiencies or kidney disease, where proteins leak into the urine. Refeeding edema is seen after rapid introduction of nutrition after prolonged periods of starvation. Then there's myxoedema, a condition often associated with hypothyroidism. Here, an increase in interstitial osmotic pressure occurs due to deposits of hyaluronic acid. It results in a kind of non-pitting edema, where the skin does not retain a dimple after being pressed. This is different from the pitting edema, where the skin does not spring back immediately and remains indented. While we're talking about non-pitting edema, let's not forget angioedema. This condition, often an allergic reaction, causes swelling in the deep layers of the skin, usually around the umbrellas and lips. Angioedema is a side effect on AC inhibitors like captopril and lisinopril used in hypertensive patients. Now let's consider congestive cardiac failure. Here, edema is often found on dependent parts of the body like the legs, because gravity plays a major role and it's most evident in the evening, making it different from the periorbital edema and facial puffiness seen in nephrotic syndrome, which decreases during the day and is maximum when the patient wakes up in the morning. Finally, we have ascites, a type of edema seen in hepatic conditions like liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension, where fluid accumulates in the abdominal cavity. This usually occurs before pedal edema, where swelling is evident in the feet and lower legs. Just like in any family, each condition is unique, but they share some traits. Now that we know what edema is and how it relates to other conditions, let's look at how we can identify it. Edema can be quite the chameleon, appearing in different forms and places, but you can learn its tricks. In the world of medical sleuthing, identifying edema is like solving a complex puzzle. Edema, or the accumulation of fluid in certain bodily spaces, can be demonstrated clinically in several ways be it in ambulatory patients who can move around freely or non-ambulatory ones who can't, the sites of edema can vary widely. In ambulatory patients, for instance, edema often shows up in the lower extremities, thanks to the pull of gravity. These patients may notice swelling in their ankles and feet, especially by the end of the day. On the other hand, non-ambulatory patients, such as those confined to bed, may develop edema in the back sacral region buttocks or even the back of the arms and legs but edema doesn't play fair it can show up on one side of the body or both causing unilateral or bilateral edema each has its unique causes and conditions bilateral edema affecting both sides of the body can be due to a variety of causes it could be the result of cardiac issues like heart failure renal problems like nephrotic syndrome or hepatic conditions such as liver cirrhosis other culprits include inferior vena cava obstruction, endocrine disorders such as hypothyroidism, allergic reactions like angioneurotic edema, and nutritional causes like protein deficiency, anemia, and thiamine deficiency, known as beriberi. Unilateral edema, which affects only one side of the body, can also arise from numerous sources. 
These could be lymphatic issues like lymphatic obstruction in filariasis, tumors like breast carcinoma, trauma, infections like cellulitis, metabolic conditions like gout, venous problems like varicose veins, or even hereditary factors like Milroy's disease. For instance, deep vein thrombosis could cause unilateral edema in the affected leg. Understanding the causes of edema and the conditions associated with it can help us recognize and manage this fluid-filled foe. Remember, in congestive cardiac failure, edema is found on dependent parts of the body and is most evident in the evening. In nephrotic syndrome, facial puffiness and generalized edema decrease during the day and are maximum when the patient wakes up in the morning. In hepatic causes, ascites or fluid accumulation in the abdomen occurs before pedal edema or swelling of the feet. Edema might be a master of disguise, but now you're a master detective. But how can we prevent this fluid-filled foe? Prevention is better than cure, and with edema, there's no exception. Let's talk about how to prevent this uncomfortable and sometimes dangerous condition. With edema, your best defense is a good offense. That means taking steps to protect your body before the condition even arises. A key part of prevention is adopting a healthy lifestyle. Regular physical activity can help maintain good circulation, which in turn prevents fluid from accumulating in your tissues. This doesn't mean you have to run a marathon every day. Even simple exercises like walking or cycling can make a huge difference. Next, let's look at diet. Certain foods can increase your risk of edema, particularly those high in sodium. When your body has too much sodium, it holds on to water to dilute it. This can lead to fluid accumulation. So try to limit your intake of salty foods. Instead, focus on a balanced diet rich in fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, and whole grains. Drinking plenty of water can also help prevent edema. It may seem counterintuitive, but staying hydrated actually helps your body get rid of excess fluid. Another important aspect of preventing edema is understanding your body. Every body is unique and reacts differently to various factors. Paying attention to changes in your body, like sudden weight gain or swelling, can help you catch edema early and take steps to manage it. Regular medical checkups are crucial too. Many conditions that can lead to edema, such as heart or kidney disease, can be managed effectively if caught early. Regular checkups allow your doctor to monitor your health and provide early intervention if needed. Finally, if you're taking medication, be aware that some drugs like calcium channel blockers and steroids can cause edema. So, always discuss potential side effects with your healthcare provider and report any changes you notice. Remember, your body is your home. It's the only place you have to live in for your entire life. So, take care of it, and it will take care of you. It's not just about preventing edema, it's about fostering a lifestyle that promotes overall health and well-being. We've journeyed through the world of edema, from its definition to its prevention, but the journey doesn't stop here. In the vast realm of medical knowledge, edema is but a drop in the ocean. There are many more conditions, symptoms, and treatments to explore and understand. Learning about edema is not just about passing an exam or satisfying curiosity. It's about understanding the human body, its strengths, its vulnerabilities, and how we can care for it. It's about our health, our well-being, and our ability to live life to the fullest. So don't stop here. Dive deeper into the ocean of knowledge. Discover, question, and learn. Remember, knowledge is power. The more we know, the better we can care for ourselves and others. Keep learning, keep growing, and remember, your health is your wealth. Until next time, stay curious and stay healthy.